I think there's an important issue that has to be solved disease by disease. And that's the question one gets asked. OK, so I'm a patient or I'm a doctor, and I know either my own or my patient's polygenic risk score for this disease. Then the question is, what, ne what next? What do I do differently as a result of that? So I think to get this stuff into healthcare, we need to solve those questions disease by disease. We need to know what the next steps are. Uh, in the case of coronary disease, I think it's one of the easier ones. So in the UK, um, general practitioners have software sitting on their computers, which combines all of those classical uh, risk scores, cholesterol, age, sex, and so on, and comes up with a 10-year risk of coronary disease. And the GP looks at it, and if it's above the guidelines, they talk to the patient about statins. So in that case, I think all that's needed is to change the software so that there's one more box into which you can enter a polygenic risk score if it's available. And then you just press the button in exactly the same way. It does a slightly different calculation using the genetic information if it's there, not using it if it's not there, comes up with a risk uh, estimate over 10 years, and the GP interprets it in exactly the same way. So I think that's one case where, where the path to clinical usage is clear. In some of the cancers, in breast cancer, for example, um, one can think about targeting screening earlier, and then you have to do the calculations that say, well, if you change a program so you targeted a certain percent of the top few percent of women based on polygenic risk scores at this age and this often, you could use the data that's available to work out how many cases of breast cancer you'd catch early and so on. So I think we need to solve it disease by disease. Uh, we're thinking hard about that. The, the National Health Service are starting to think hard about it. In the UK, as I mentioned, there's this large five million cohort that is going ahead, that will involve polygenic risk scores. It'll force the system to work out how to incorporate those. But, but I think disease by disease and a number of other pilots will be doing the same sorts of things. I mean, I think the things that matter are the same in both countries. Um, a big research, a government funded research project is a really excellent way to catalyze this process and get the data that we need. But in both countries, if you want to you know, be legally on the market, you need to have analytical validity and then clinical validity about the meaning of that finding that you've gotten. And there's several polygenic risk scores that have gotten to the clinical validity stage. To get actual widespread adoption, whether it's in the UK or in the US, um, you need to get kind of into professional society guidelines. You need NICE to say this is what you're supposed to do, or you need the, the appropriate professional society in the United States to issue practice guidelines around it. And until then, you know, you'll get onesie twosies and, and you know, some, you know, you might get some practices that'll pick it up. But if you're, if you're going to go widespread, you need professional society guidelines. Um, and then you need somebody to pay for it. And that usually is tied to the professional society guideline part. And so to get the rest of the way there, so you need analytical validity, clinical validity, then you need clinical utility, some kind of health economic model. And at that point, you can then do you know, a large prospective study, um, either a, a randomized clinical trial or some kind of real world evidence style um, observational uh, study with this test being done in the wild. And it's at that point that the, you, where the professional societies will be considering adoption. And then the payers will consider paying. And that's when it'll, that's when it'll take off. But it's these, these large research um, initiatives that are, is going to catalyze that and facilitate that.